So thank you so much everyone that's joined in so far. Um, we are talking today about how insurance uh, and insurance tech can unlock your business. So um, thank you so much for joining this virtual power hour, uh, which is in partnership with the InsureTech Gateway. Um, we're delighted to be collaborating with Robert and Hannah and the team. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about the InsureTech Gateway over the next um, hour or so. Um, obviously, it's a great opportunity to explore the, the value that InsureTech can bring to your idea, your product or your, your, your existing business. And some of you that will be listening in will be certainly a, a slightly later stage than idea or, or product development, perhaps obviously looking for C to, you know, even Series A investment. And obviously that's what the guys at InsureTech Gateway can deliver on as well. Um, I think it's also really important in this current climate that businesses do look at sectors that are, um, are COVID, Brexit, you know, recession proof in a sense. And obviously insurance, it's going to be around forever. Um, and I think obviously the benefit of insurance is it really does cross against pretty much any sector. Um, so it, it's a fab opportunity to find out more about insure tech, but also a, a, a business sector, which is certainly not going anywhere. Um, Thank you, obviously, to the panelists that are joining us today from, from various businesses. I'm going to let Hannah and, and all of you do your introductions as well. Um, in terms of process, we're going to first hear from Robert and Maria, who are from the InsureTech Gateway. I'll, I'll let you do your, your, your proper introductions. Um, we're then going to hear from the, 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 the teams, the, the founders and obviously heads of the businesses, obviously, that have joined us today. Um, and obviously that's to be discussed around the theme of insure tech and how that can be applied to different business sectors and, and why perhaps these teams are in involved uh, in this insurance space. Also, obviously delighted to have Liam with us from uh, the um, Tech Nation, which is obviously a, a massive uh, organization working across the UK to support the, the tech scene, whether that's through start, grow and scale. Um, so delighted, Liam, thank you for joining us as well today. Um, Hannah's thankfully moderating that part of the agenda, so you don't need to listen to my my voice uh, or or look at my balding hair or head, as I should mention, Humphrey. Um, and obviously, when obviously, I'd like to also ask anybody that's got questions to just drop them in the Q and A box, which is at the bottom there. We're not going to try and interrupt the panel um, unless panelists you see a question coming in and you think I'd love to answer that there and then. Um, if not, I'll wrap up the best questions and obviously ask anyone at the end as well. Um, obviously, then we'll hear back from Hannah at the end, just who's going to wrap up how, how maybe you guys can reach out to the InsureTech Gateway. Um, just bearing in mind as well, although no one actually, we can't see any of the attendees' faces, we are taking photographs from today. Um, so um, anyone that's on the panel, best smiles, and obviously they might be going on social over the next hour or so. Um, and hopefully we've got someone doing that for us today as well. So um, I'm going to pass you over to Maria and Robert from the InsureTech Gateway, just as an introduction, just to find out a little bit more about the business and obviously how you guys operate as well. So over to uh, Maria and Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair, for such a kind introduction. Very, very excited to be part of this event. Uh, just a quick introduction to myself. So I lead on the portfolio management side uh, as part of the InsureTech Gateway team. Um, and we'll just give Rob an opportunity to introduce himself before we jump into the question. Great, thank you Maria, thank you Alistair and yes welcome everybody. The, uh, yeah, my name is Robert Lumley, most people call me Rob but uh, I um, uh, co-founded the, the uh, Gateway about uh, four and a half years ago now so we'll go on to talk all about that in, in a moment. Yes great, thank you Rob. Could you tell us please the story of how you came to a profound insurance Gateway? Yeah sure, I guess it was probably about, um, probably four, well, it was four and a half years ago that I had the fortunate introduction to be introduced to um, Stephen Britton, who's a, a co-founder at the, at the Gateway. Um, we were really looking at um, what innovation had happened in the insurance space pretty much over the last 30 years. And I suppose we summed it up by realizing that um, uh, innovation had really happened in distribution. So sort of 30 years ago, you had people who uh, centralized a rating table and then used a telephone to actually get rates to people and then you ended up with uh, comparison sites coming in and disrupting uh, further the, the distribution but there'd been very little product innovation for uh, the insurance industry and so we sat down and said what is it that's stopping product innovation in the insurance space and and essentially it's just very complicated very expensive and very time time con uh, constrained to get to a product to market 
So we really set about putting into place a platform that enables startups to accelerate their understanding of the insurance world. So people from outside the insurance world would be able to, to join in. That's great. Thank you, Rob. No, I, I couldn't agree more that there, at the moment, there are quite a lot of barriers to uh, entering the market. So could you tell us a little bit more about the InsurTech Gateway platform and how you're fixing these barriers to market entrance? Sure. The, the, the primary, so over the years, I'd sort of set up a number of uh, different insurance breaking businesses, but my background had been in insurance. Uh, but the, the primary challenge that anybody in insurance or somebody coming into the insurance world from outside faces is, is the fact that you need operational capital. So you've got to fund yourself whilst you, you actually try and start a product. Uh, you've then got to find underwriting capital to be able to ensure the risk and transfer the risk to obviously the, the people who take on on the insurance side of things. And you've also got to have regulatory approval. So those three hurdles are really quite a challenge for anybody operating in this space. And, and if you're certainly if you come from outside the insurance space to try and navigate your way around it is a, is a lengthy process. And we, we came across people who'd spent um, three years and up to about three million pounds in some cases, trying to get to a point where they hadn't, they hadn't even got to market, they hadn't issued their, their first policy. So the Gateway set up a platform that enables startups and, and people from outside the industry, and you'll hear from the panelists um, later on, but the, you know, the, the people who came from maybe outside the insurance space from banking or from uh, shared housing or from um, any other sector, or perhaps they had an incident um, or situation where they'd um, uh, had a loss and they, they thought, gosh, uh, that would be really uh, important if I didn't have it. So they innovated new product ideas there. Um, and we enable people really to get straight into uh, finding underwriting capacity, getting regulatory approval and getting money to start and test their product in market. Thank you, Rob. So yeah, effectively just accelerating that uh, route to market and almost acting like the sharpest for the for the uh, yeah. people approaching the insurance world. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. and, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's just such a challenge for people to uh, if they if they come from outside the states to get into and navigate their way around. We, we solve it for, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, also for people who are maybe less familiar with uh, insurtech space, why are insurtech business models so exciting? Oh, gosh, how long have we got? Um, the, I think what's, what's changed um, from this distribution type of things to now to, to product is that technology has enabled um, uh, people to really understand risk uh, so much better now, so that, and in real time, and we're, I know we'll hear from Mark talking about dynamic pricing and things later on, but real time knowledge of what's going on in the marketplace is really changing. And anybody thinking that they might have a domain experience in, a, in outside of the insurance, I think is now looking at insurance as really quite an interesting part and product has got to change. Uh, the market is changing, COVID-19 has changed things. I think the market was changing anyhow. We, we've ended up with large unicorn businesses now coming out of the woodwork, which are new economies, the sharing economy. We'll hear from Humphrey about that later as well. Um, and, and so we, we find ourselves with a, uh, a marketplace that really needs uh, completely reshaping the, the insurance risks are different and people are now not insured in areas where they thought they were. And I think that has been borne bare by the, by the COVID-19. People thought they had cover and they didn't. That's great. Thank you, Rob. Um, I, I agree. I think it's a definitely a very interesting emerging space and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear a lot more about it from our panel today. Um, Alistair, if I can hand back over to you. Are you, you're in need. Some people prefer me on mute, to be fair. <laughs> um, so thank you, Robert and, and Maria there for obviously that succinct kind of overview of InsureTech and obviously the InsureTech gateway as well. Um, I'm going to introduce Hannah, who in, in my screen is bottom left, might not be on yours, but obviously Hannah's there and she's going to be moderate, moderating the panel now um, that um, Kimberly, Liam, Humphrey, uh, Mark and Sharon have all kindly 
uh, offered their time to take part in. I'm not going to say who they are and what they do too much. I'm going to pass it over to Hannah, who's going to lead the, the panel. Um, I look forward to hearing some great questions coming through from the, 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 the attendees as well. So obviously, Hannah, over to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, so I'd like to ask Mark a question first. Mark Musson is the co-founder of Human AI, the world's first dynamic pricing model for fleets. Mark, can you tell us about the origins of your business and the moment you decided to reframe it as an insure tech business model? Thanks, Hannah, and <clears throat> thanks for the introduction. I'm not sure there's a specific moment, but um, we certainly didn't start out with insurance in mind when we started our business. Um, my background and team's background is in investment banking, specifically working with data, fast, big amounts of data. And um, we sort of, we, we really started looking at opportunities where um, our initial thesis was that uh, where we could amass a, a significant amount of data in an interesting space, um, which had a lot of unsolved problems. And part of that research was sort of experiential and part of it was, was more sort of market driven. And we settled on what was happening within mobility and the whole sort of car ownership space with our view being everything will eventually be autonomous and, um, and that, that, that becomes a really interesting data driven problem. There, there's so many problems to solve, which, which you need data for. They're developing all of these algorithms for perception and control mechanisms. Um, and yeah, so we started out our business with a view that if we gathered enough of the sort of roadside data, we could really work out a way to monetize that. We didn't start with a business model in mind, I think is the way that we describe it. We started um, with a data business first and built a data platform that was able to, I guess, keep a real time sort of digital shadow of any vehicle. And, um, and that gave us a lot of opportunities. But one of the challenges with a model like that is you need to amass huge amounts of data for it to be able to be of any value to some sort of training. And, you know, you end up with bias in the data, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the ways that we um, looked at doing that is eventually we, we started working with um, with the, uh, the owner of a fleet of about 400 Priuses that get leased to Uber drivers on a weekly basis. And these vehicles are doing 60,000 miles per annum per vehicle. Um, so our initial challenge was how do we get the sort of three to 5,000 miles sort of per annum average person to submit their data and, and suddenly sort of stopped even looking at pursuing that just based on the fact that a couple of thousand miles isn't very interesting. But the thing that we were challenged with by, by Mike, the fleet owner was, do you know what? Um, you can have all the data you like, but you just have to solve my insurance problem. It's intractable. And that led us literally into thinking about insurance, not actually building an insurance business, but thinking about using the data to solve insurance. And as someone who sort of built trading systems, for me, it was logical. I just looked inside all the data we had and hang on, these things are all in different states and different places. So we can just build a sort of a, a trading engine to arbitrage those different risk states and attribute a price to it. So we sort of built a, we built our dynamic pricing engine first without understanding what the actual price was or, or what the actual sort of the correct price for the exposure was at that point in time. And that's when we kind of knew we were onto something. We spent a lot of time speaking to the insurance industry and everyone went, that's a great idea. It will never work. No one will do it. Um, and that's where the challenge that Rob articulated uh, sort of sprung up. Um, we did eventually end up with the gateway and they, they shepherded us through very quickly into an active sort of insurance model. Um, but in order to get there, we very much built out almost a full stack insurance product to do that. So we didn't start as an insure tech when we, when we discovered the business model and the way to monetize things. Um, as Rob said, the barriers to entry are enormous. But for us, I think the takeaway is that once you're over those barriers, it's also a significant moat. Um, you know, there are not that many people following behind you, or if they are, you know, they, they, they have to climb that mountain as well. So for me, those are the takeaways. Um, and then also, once you get inside the insurance business, start starting to, um, to hack and take apart the financial mechanics of the risk transfer transaction actually starts to get really exciting for us. And it isn't just some old boring thing that's been going on for hundreds of years that started in a coffee shop. It's, it's back into you know, financial engineering and it's super interesting for the team as well. So we've been able to attract and retain people who just really are interested in that risk transfer transaction. Awesome, thanks for sharing Mark. So very much a data business first without a clear revenue stream that turned out to be a perfect fit for an insurtech business model. Totally. 
The origins of collective benefits are at the opposite end of the scale, very much an insure tech from day one. Kimberly Hurd, Collective Benefits Chief Revenue Officer, is here with us today. Kimberly, could you tell us how the idea was born? Yeah, I mean, exactly as you said, I mean, we almost started the exact opposite, um, but similar to almost any startup, we started with a pain and solving for a pain. And in this case, it was um, our CEO and co-founder, Anthony was knocked out of work with a back injury for about six months. Um, and as he was unable to work, he was continually told by his freelancer friends how lucky he was um, that he was still being paid. And you know, it was a light bulb moment in realizing um, how many people who are self-employed and independent workers um, did not have the same benefit um, if they're sick or if they're injured and, and, and unable to work of actually being uh, continuing to be paid. Um, and the numbers are staggering. So 96% of self-employed workers have no form of uh, income protection. Um, the numbers aren't small either. Uh, so uh, we're currently at 6 million uh, independent workers here in the UK alone, and it's soon to be about 50% of the marketplace. Um, we started with thinking about insurance as a way of solving it. And we, what we don't discovered is that there's a significant financial, mental wellness and physical wellness need within the community. Um, so to put this uh, as an example, um, about 50% of self-employed workers have less than 200 pounds in savings. Um, so if they're unable to work, um, they're actually still showing up. So our stats show something like 32% in the current work environment are sick and injured and still showing up for work. Um, by providing insurance and working with their platforms, we're able to actually create a win-win. Um, so we work with some of the leading on-demand marketplaces, everyone from TaskRabbit um, to Stewart and Logistics and Mobility. Um, and by providing um, insurance and benefits for their on-demand workers, we actually solve a problem on their side, which is churn and engagement, um, and also for the self-employed workers by actually making sure they're looked after. Um, so we started with insurance um, and unlocked um, a real commercial need um, and a social need um, and solved both. That's amazing. Thanks, Kimberly. It's great to hear that InsureTech is really enabling you to step up and provide a safety net for those independent workers. And those numbers are crazy, a huge underinsured market. Yeah, I mean, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. There you go, Kimberly. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I mean, it's it, it, it's hugely exciting. Um, and, you know, I think, um, so I, my background is not insurance. Um, in fact, many, many of us on the team have never come from an insurance background. We actually come from the operational side. So working on on-demand marketplaces, Uber, um, you know, you name it, where we understand very intimately the needs um, from an operational perspective. Um, but what we didn't realize is how much insurance can unlock the opportunity on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's a similar story to um, Guard Hog Tech, which is another startup focused on one of tomorrow's economies, needing risk management for short term rentals like Airbnb. Um, so Humphrey Bowles is one of the co-founders. Humphrey, could you tell us um, about working in the sharing economy and the role that insurance is playing to enable the sector to scale? Thanks, Hannah. So look, trust, safety, risk management and insurance. Uh, without doubt the biggest problems the sharing economy faces um, i mean we estimate the cost uh, in the short-term rentals industry alone think airbnb at about 21.9 billion per year in damage and lost opportunity and what insurance does is it creates trust and trust is critical to the peer-to-peer -peer sector um it's worth defining trust um i take it as a confident reliance on someone when you yourself are in a position of vulnerability. And when this comes to the sharing economy, there are really three hurdles that people have to get over. They've got to trust that a new idea will work and is safe. They've got to trust that the platform or third party facilitating the activity is going to uphold their end of the bargain. And then they've got to also trust the other user. Now, without insurance, there is arguably just too much downside to get involved. As with millions of transactions, something is going to go wrong. And that's why insurance, or really, as I like to call it, having a backup plan, is just so important and is the key building block. So, you know, working from the ground up, with insurance, you build confidence. And with confidence, you build trust. And with trust, you build the whole peer-to-peer -peer economy. And the brilliantly 
awesome, dazzling thing about InsureTech is that you're combining insurance, which hasn't really changed, with beautiful technology that allows you to dramatically change how risk is perceived, analyzed, and executed by incorporating you know, real-time risk management tools, big data, AI, and you can really drop in whatever buzzwords you want to in that space. And all in all, you know, this is creating a really fertile ground for technology engineered insurance and then boom with the peer to peer economy off to the races or at least you're off to stay in a pretty awesome airbnb down the road <laughs> i love that humphrey let's ban the word insurance and replace it with trust or protection much better <laughs> sharon is another insurance outsider previously working at the royal mint on their digital assets project she is now the Chief Product Officer at CoinCover, the company making digital assets simple and safe for everyone. Sharon, could you tell us how the idea of CoinCover was born and what your InsureTech business model has enabled you to achieve? Hi, Hannah, absolutely, and, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm great, I'm happy to be talking to you here because as Hannah said, um, I don't have um, an insurance background, I have a tech background. And the founders of CoinCover met about six years ago um, while working for the British Royal Mint. And they are the, the, the business in the UK that strikes those little shiny objects that when we were allowed to go out and about, we, we used to buy things with. And coinage is obviously declining. And we were set the task of thinking about the future of money. And back then, we, we looked at things like digital money, um, Apple Pay, um, credit cards, all different sorts of things that would be the future vehicle for currency. And we came across Bitcoin. And I'm sure many of you by now have heard of Bitcoin. Um, but back then, it was much less known. It was very, very ver versatile. But... Um, the volatility in the pricing meant that it just wasn't suitable to be a currency. So we then thought, well, we're sitting on um, tons of gold in the vaults below us. Why don't we take that gold, digitize it, put it on an exchange, build wallets, and enable peer-to-peer -peer payments and remittances? And back in 2016, the team launched Royal Mint Gold. Now, subsequent to that, we realized, okay, there's still problems to be solved. So we've heard today that, you know, one of the real reasons for, for creating a startup is to solve a real world problem. And one of the other comments today was about that trust and security. And that's actually exactly what CoinCover does is we, we built it to bring trust and security into the world of cryptocurrency. Now, the issue, and we've heard lots of um, scare stories, is that people can lose access to the cryptocurrency. Um, that is, they, they lose access to their wallet keys or exchanges or wallets get hacked and the cryptocurrency gets stolen. So we thought, okay, that is a solid problem to solve. There's about 4 billion worth of crypto that has just been lost or stolen since crypto was invented. And it, it's a big market to go after. So we built out tech that would essentially enable us to, to solve that problem. Now, tech, however, is just one half of the story. So we, we could go and talk to customers and tell them how we've got this amazing solution that would keep all of your cryptocurrency safe and secure. But the problem is how, how would they trust us over any other exchange or wallet provider out there. So the light bulb moment really was, okay, insurance. If we can have our tech promise backed by an insurance guarantee, then that would basically give us as a business credibility, but also it would enable us to provide that credibility and well, the instant credibility to our customers that would then subsequently be able to onboard new customers. So the insurance element has, has been an absolute driver for us because it's been an enabler. We can now go into a company, we can talk about our tech and we can say, look, we're here to make sure that all your cryptocurrency holdings, your customers holdings are very, very safe. But if you don't believe us, for the record, we are Lloyds of London guaranteed and we've got a backup plan for you. And really that, that insurance stamp of approval that the gateway helps us get, along with FCA accreditation as well, has, has just essentially 
you know, being that enabler for us to have the conversations and walk into a conversation with, with trust, assuredness, and, and it's really been a driver for us. So I like to think of our company as kind of like an insurtech slash fintech company. And I think that it, it's really useful for any founder out there, whatever kind of tech company they are, to think about the synergies to be had with, with an insurtech and, and think about the gateway as an enabler. It's not, you know, you, it, you have to be one or the other. Insurance is definitely an enabler, I think, to any business out there. And it certainly has been for us. Thank you, Sharon. That's a really interesting point you make about um, InsureTech being able to be the enabler. So you don't have to necessarily classify yourself as a strict InsureTech, but it might still be an element of your business. Super cool. <laughs> and that brings us to our only non-startup panelist, Liam Gray. Liam is the FinTech lead at Tech Nation, as Al mentioned earlier, supporting FinTech founders accelerate their businesses over a six month program. With this year's cohort featuring our very own Flood Flash and Coin Cover. Liam, you have spent five years working with many different insure techs. What are the main barriers to entry that founders, uh, that you find founders come across when they're trying to navigate this space? Um, thanks a lot, Hannah. And um, I think Robert covered some of the really important ones and I'll just make sure I don't dwell on those and um, cover some of the others. So capital and regulation are massively important and Robert covered that off. But um, I'll cover a softer one um, first, which is more the bias against insurance and the lack of understanding. Um, most people interact with their insurer once a year um, when they buy their insurance and then when they renew it. And they're unlucky if they uh, interact with their insurer twice a year um, because normally it involves a claim and you have to hope that that claim experience will actually be good um, for you to have a good interpretation and um, view of your insurer. And that's only a sliver of what the insurance industry is. So that's looking at personal lines, normally motor or um, home insurance and or maybe even travel. So I feel like the understanding of the industry is limited. And then you've got people um, who will just see that as the whole industry. So once you get an opportunity to understand that there's commercial lines, there's reinsurance, there's other elements of it, there's an asset management um, element of the industry, um, you realize that there's so many other opportunities here. And it involves doing the research in order to find out what the opportunities are, what the pain points are, and eventually start um, solving, some of, um, solving some of those pain points. So that's the first one. And then the second uh, major barrier is relationships. Um, insurance is really a relationships driven industry. And the more time you spend in the industry, the more, time, um, the more you'll realize how important relationships are. Um, I know this can be said for most B2B industries, but just go down to Lloyd's or go, um, go to the square mile and you'll understand what I mean. And those are important. So an insurance gateway, for example, is massively um, powerful in opening doors um, to people who are key stakeholders within the industry. So that is another big barrier, but once you're in with a few people, um, you'll normally get access to quite a few um, others. So those are the two big ones I want to add on top of um, regulation and capital. So that would be the understanding and relationships. Awesome, nice one, Liam. Um, so moving on to some more positive things, what are, what are the areas that most excite you that have the most potential for innovation within InsureTech? Absolutely. So um, many of the panelists have mentioned this already. It's just external, one's external data. So there's so many external data sources that are so exciting for insurers to get their hands on and reinsurers as well. Uh, you can sort of like go back and say to yourself that insurance has historically been a data industry. So the people in the insurance industry are well, are very, very familiar with using various different data sources um, to price risk and um, underwrite business. But um, more and more new data sets are um, arising, mainly because more and more new markets are being created. So for example, the economy, um, as people have mentioned already. Uh, seeing what insurers um, in, con in conjunction with people from outside of the industry can actually do with these new data sets is fascinating and beyond insurance as well. So it's not just about um, risk transfer, it's about what can we do pre-loss, um, what can we do post-loss as well. So there's a lot of different elements that are super exciting with respect to um, coming together with other industries. And that ties into another one which is quite interesting as well embedding insurance in other customer journeys um, 
and adding a contextual element to it. So you'll see there's always been home insurance, motor insurance, et cetera. But now we're starting to see these products, services get closer and closer to the customer to a point where they don't even realize that um, they get an insurance sometimes. As, um, as Kimberly mentioned and um, Sharon mentioned, um, it's an enabler. Um, so it enables you to do so many things. And for example, a gig economy worker may be covered by insurance without them even knowing it sometimes, um, and it enables them to do their job. So that's super exciting. How can you embed it in other areas and how can you help people from outside of the industry actually use insurance to allow people to do much, much more? Nice one, Liam. Thanks for highlighting those areas. Really interesting. Now on to the quick fire round. So just one minute each to answer the question. Alistair is on the clock and will ring the buzzer if you go over time. <laughs> so same question to everyone. Name one characteristic of an awesome InsureTech and why. Sharon, would you like to kick us off? I think it's about supporting us and delivering to our customers. So being a startup, you're always there for delivering a customer need. And it's not just about, as we talked about earlier, about the enablement of supporting us as a business. It's really exciting to also be able to pass that benefit, that credibility, that security onto our customers and also enable them to scale and grow. And when you're in a space like we are, which is a crypto space, that's that's hugely powerful um, and ever so more important. Um, so I think that's really what's what's awesome about working in with the, with the gateway. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Kimberly, should we come to you next? Oh gosh, I mean, I think I would, I would just echo really that. I mean, it's about an acute um, customer centricity um, that I think unlocks so much of the innovate and innovation and ability to scale, um, which is really exciting. Um, so on our side, I mean, it's really understanding deeply what our B2B customers needs are. Um, you know, these are quickly growing, you know, gig economy platforms that have, you know, struggled to really create, you know, a stable sense of supply, which is their workers, um, you know, understand insurance and the nuances of it and find flexible and adaptable um, assurance products that help accelerate their growth. Um, so there's a lot to do to really innovate to create the best levels of insurance for them. Um, but equally, as we've been talking about, it really unlocks a sense of freedom and flexibility for gig workers. Um, for the first time, being able to have things that are accessible, um, understandable, transparent. Um, you know, my background started in financial services and being able to sort of just really even explain and sort of make in um, plain English what insurance is, how do you access it, make sure things are um, you know, especially when making a claim as easy as possible. There's so much room for innovation. Um, I think it's having that ruthless sense of what, who is the customer, what are their actual needs, and what do we unlock with an insurance to, to solve for them? Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Liam, should we come to you next? Sure. Um, kind of touching on things that have been mentioned already. Um, just the simplicity of the proposition, I'd say. Um, I find and this will go for any um, startup or scale-up company. I find if you can clearly define who this is for and what impact it's going to make, it's so much easier to sell that product or service. So I'll always say just make it super simple and let the buyer know what they're getting for it. Thanks, Liam. Humphrey? Uh, my characteristic would be creativity, Han. Um, I think you've got to make sure that your product is better, faster, safer and cheaper, because if it's not, you're probably not going to succeed. And then you've got to be really creative in how you're presenting your opportunity to insurers and try and make them greenfield opportunities rather than cannibalizing their existing business, because no insurer likes likes that, as it were. Thank you, Humphrey. Um, last but not least, Mark. Yeah, I think it's tenacity. I mean, you're going to hear no a lot. Um, and uh, not accepting no is, is what leads to breakthroughs. So for me, it's, it's all about tenacity, about the ability to just listen to what you're being told, figure out what the objections are, where the challenges are, <clears throat> and then craft and recraft and recraft the product to uh, meet both sides of the of, of, of the equation. I mean, <clears throat> insurance is a risk transfer transaction. And it involves two parties. It isn't just about making it better, faster, or cheaper for the customer. It's also about making it safer for the capital provider. 
um, and so understanding the financial mechanics and uh, and having the tenacity to to work through the detail of that and make it safe for both sides and 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 I guess useful for for the end insured is is really for me what uh, what makes it interesting and therefore that's the characteristic that that I try and highlight from our side. Thank you, Mark. On to the next quick fire round question. Please, can you all share your top tip or tips if you can squeeze more than one in for a non-insurance founder thinking about coming into the space? So Liam, should we start with you this time? Sure. Um, make sure you make sure you learn about the space um, holistically. I mean, there may be obvious opportunities, but there's also some less obvious opportunities as well. So have a good understanding of um, what's there, you, not, not necessarily in depth, just a high level understanding at least, so that you can make sure what your skills are and what you can bring to the table can be applied to the best place in insurance rather than the one that you understand first. Thanks, Liam. Mark? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of echo that and sort of expand on it as well. And it's truly to understand the unit economics once you've really understood the protection gap because you know, fractionalizing um, a, I don't know, let's make some stuff up here, a, a scooter ride for, for five cents when the potential exposure is, you know, quite a few million for bodily injury claim um, doesn't make sense. So really understanding the market opportunity uh, at the unit economic side of things. And then um, I, I guess learning to present your, um, your proposition to insurance capacity in a very succinct way in, in language in terms that they understand. Um, we spent a lot of a lot of time saying, I guess, confusing things because we were confused. So actually studying the mechanics is very useful to, to accelerating some of those barriers, getting um, risk capital, and then also from an approval perspective, making sure that you can articulate that you can run a safe business and what the requirements are and you to do that. Thank you, Mark. Kimberly? I mean, simple advice, speak to InsureTech Gateway. Um, you know, you guys have been incredible in helping us, you know, uh, navigate the industry. I think Liam mentioned, you know, it's hugely relationship driven, um, understanding some of the hidden costs, um, you know, the, the uh, some of the potential barriers and how best to navigate those. Um, speak to InsureTech, uh, in, sorry, InsureTech Gateway. Awesome, nice one, Kimberly. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Sharon, should we hear from you next? Yeah, so I would say come with an open mind. Um, think about the problem that you're in love with solving and really think about the synergies that can be had with whatever space you're in, be it health tech or insure tech, I'm sorry, or fintech. And think about the synergies. And we, we've talked a lot today about insurance being an enabler. And for me, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of outsiders think like I used to, and the insurance was very boring. But when you actually come into the gateway and you look at, really, it, it's all about innovation and it's really about business enablement and particular startup enablement, looking at different business models, different ways of doing things. And then it really becomes exciting. So, you know, growing a business is super, super exciting, but also helping your customers grow their business is also equally exciting and talked about it already, but that enablement to, to a business to help them grow, I think is, is, it, it has the potential to be a benefit for anybody out there. So again, come with an open mind and really talk to the gateway about the problem that you're trying to solve. And they have the minds that really can sort of like give you ideas of how insurance can be that an enabler. Awesome. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, last but not least, Humphrey. So I'll, I'll echo lots of things everyone has already said, um, including myself. Like, you know, I don't think insurance is boring at all. I think it is probably the most creative industry that you can work in using words and language to create amazing financial products that apply today to you. And like, that is so brilliant that you think that you could make a financial product today for your new sector. I saw a question pop up on VR tech, like brilliant, like amazing. Like you're probably the expert in that sector and you don't even know it yet. Like that gives you such a huge advantage 
that uh, design tomorrow's insurance product for that space. And that is such a brilliant, creative, fun thing to do. So insurance is not dull, is not boring, is at the cutting edge of trust and safety. And, you know, strap yourself in and ride the tiger. <laughs> Love that, Humphrey. Thank you very much. Um, so opening the floor to everyone now, um, what would you say to a founder who felt a little intimidated by the insurance sector? I, I say you're right, but also you shouldn't be intimidated. Um, but yeah, I think just to echo, I think what everyone's been saying, what I said earlier is, is just try and understand it a little bit before you dive in. Um, you know, it's super diverse. There are huge chunks of it that are sort of businesses in their own right. The distribution side, um, for me, the most exciting side is deeply inside the actual risk transfer transaction, which is where the products are made. Um, and you might not be there, but but certainly, um, you know, try and understand the sector a bit more and don't be intimidated. I mean, I mean, Han, who's not intimidated by the insurance sector? I mean, like, like I, I can't think of anyone who's not scared of the ivory tower of Lloyd's building. I mean, it looks like the Dark Lord's empire base, doesn't it, from the outside? Um, no, look, I'm going to have to copy Kimberly and say, look, if you are intimidated, to be expected but that is where the gateway is going to be able to give you an education in how you can take your idea and get it executed in as quick a time as possible because you know let's be cutthroat about this you know this is about a land grab it's about the opportunity it's about seizing the opportunity and running with it and in order to execute a brilliant idea and make it work, it is not so much about the idea, it's about the execution of it. And that's where the gateway is mega. And, um, you know, that is why you should be intimidated, but harness that intimidation to your advantage and speak to Rob, Maria, Stephen, Richard. You know, those are the guys, sorry, I forgot you, Charlie. Um, those are the guys, you know, who are really gonna help you um, get the idea out there. Yeah, I, I would just say come with an open mind, come with questions, nobody bites and you never know, you, you might go away with a really good idea. It's and it is is super exciting. Yeah, I would also say just I mean, a lot of people have talked about how hard it is. And you're right, it's intimidating. I mean, me coming into this, I can't tell you how many hours of training and books I've read in order to start feeling confident in it. But um, outside of that, I mean, there also creates a, a unique barrier to entry. Um, so if you do survive it, the opportunity is huge. Um, and my background has been food tech. Um, there you can throw something on product hunt or start with your own M MVP. I think Will Shu was going around on a bike delivering things. I mean, this is a very different um, you know, set of constraints that you have to solve for. But once you get there, the opportunity is significant. And so focus on the opportunity at the end. Amazing. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I think I'll hand over to Al now, if that's OK, um, to do a bit of q and I see a few have come through on the chat. Wow. Some great questions that have come through. I just wanted to, to pass on, obviously, some, some words that I've picked up on, which is unlocking and enabling accessibility, trust. They're all key words that I perhaps wouldn't have thought about insurance before. Um, so it's great that you've been able to drill those words into probably the attendees' minds as well. Um, secondly, Sharon, I just have this visualization of you sitting above a, a vault of gold and I couldn't help but pick up on that line, obviously, when you were, when you were describing, obviously, how you came up with your, the proposition. Um, Humphrey, I think you're a star. I think you should, you've got all these buzzwords. I'm going to be cutting quite a few of the, the little lines that you've given and we'll put them out on social. Um, I think obviously collectively there's just been so much advice that you guys have given so thank you obviously and what the first question um, I wanted to actually pick up on was obviously from uh, Christian who I actually met about a week ago um, who is a, a, a student based up in Newcastle if I remember rightly um, and he has it and is working on a VR solution at the moment and the question was how will ensure tech help in the world of virtual reality and the immersive space I was going to jump in and say training, um, maybe health and safety. I can imagine they might be two areas um, where perhaps obviously you could build products obviously that would perhaps obviously better enable um, 
the, 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 the say the logistics industry to better prepare their workers for health and safety issues that perhaps could link into insurance. Um, Robert, um, or one of the InsureTech Gateway team, has, has anyone got any ideas on that or obviously any of the startup founders? Can I jump in there, Alistair? That, I mean, absolutely right. You've nailed it in one there. The, the, um, you start looking at what, what it could do in terms of health and safety and so on, but it, it gets back to what is the risk we're trying to avoid. And, and we've heard about it a lot today in terms of risk transfer is that actually, if you think of insurance as offlaying a risk that you, you don't know is coming, um, if you knew it was coming, you wouldn't actually um, price it. You, know, you wouldn't actually pay for it. You wouldn't pay a premium to get rid of it. So um, anything like a, a, a virtual type training session would help to reduce a risk. It might be in a risk, it might be in an elevator or it might be in a building, it might be on, out on site. So understand the risk and then apply that to how you can then save that person who's owning the risk money from an insurance premium point of view. That would be my suggestion on that. And that nothing is, uh, we've heard a lot today, nothing is, we have this expression in the office, which is bonkers or brilliant. Nothing is too bonkers for us. We need to know what is coming down the line, how risk is changing so that we can save premiums being spent unnecessarily and given to, to the insurance industry unnecessarily to make sure that the person can avoid the risk in the first place. Excellent. Um, obviously, Stephen, who's one of the attendees, said VR open heart surgery, which I think obviously, yes, absolutely. Anything that kind of gives people the opportunity to train better um, to save lives, obviously, bingo, insurance. Um, anybody else on the panel want to add anything in there in terms of VR and immersive experiences? Yeah, just, just a quick one on the immersive experiences. Um, I know that some companies, for example, were looking at risk assessment on oil rigs, for example. So how you can actually, um, without going out there, how can you have a feeling of actually assessing the risk, going around the whole rig? And that's super difficult um, to have to take a boat out there and then come back and it's very resource intensive. So they're looking at new ways to do these things and these risks um, are there and they need solutions for it. So that's one way that immersive technology is already starting to move into it. And um, some companies I've seen looking at that. So there's definitely a space for it. Excellent, Liam, thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is um, from Claire Ryan. Um, Claire has a, a, a cyber security business, uh, tech business uh, that's based in Ireland. Um, can you be too early to chat with the team at InsureTech Gateway? Uh, I can take Depends that. whether you have a, oh yeah, I can. <laughs> I can give you my experience. I think you, you, if you are early, it, you know, your idea will, will get shaped and beaten out into some form of, um, of uh, workable proposition. So I would say, no, you're never too early. I mean, may, maybe if you just sort of woke up that morning and said, I'm, I'm thinking about it, maybe not. But if you've been noodling about a problem for a while, uh, just to chat, you know, it doesn't mean to say you, you're going to get investment, but just to chat will help you. So I don't think it's ever too early. Excellent. Um, in, in terms, obviously, then, then there's a follow-on question, Robert and, and Hannah and Maria. What level do you guys obviously not incubate, but invest at or as a fund? Where, where, where do you sit there? I come in there. The, uh, so so the, if you think of the, any startup, actually, even outside of the insurance space, um, you kind of have to go through to make sure that you get your customer proposition correct to start with. And that's going to be a, an early stage view on what's, you know, what um, the ideas are. Uh, and I think what happens is that people tend to get to a point where they uh, haven't quite solved the product fit. We can solve all the insurability issues, as we've heard this afternoon. But if the product doesn't actually suit the need, um, you can spend a lot of money uh, sort of getting to a point where actually your, your, um, your product would never fit into the marketplace, the timing's wrong, or it's just not actually solving a problem that needs solving. So um, we get involved, as you were saying earlier, at the early stage. We try and help people shape the ideas. That generally can probably take you a few months to make sure that you've, you've got the idea correct and make sure that we can get it insurable. Um, and then it's a case of getting the proposition. And we will typically follow uh, from early seed, pre-seed sometimes, pre -seed, well, not sometimes, all the time, pre-seed stage, seed stage, series A, series B. And we'll help with the funding um, going through those different stages and, and follow on uh, from our initial investments, provided we're reaching, reaching the right sort of points that everybody thinks it's working. Excellent. Um, I'm going to uh, jump into the, the first question that came in actually from Pierce. 
Um, it's quite a long question, so forgive me. In terms of getting regulatory approval, could you explain exactly how you have helped startups with this challenge? Just to give it some context, this is the main issue we faced when we were approached by a number of insurance companies um, was that we couldn't get the regulatory approval from an insurance perspective for our product. Um, do any of the startup founders want to kind of jump in on that one? Obviously, just bearing in mind, obviously, they've probably had to go through that journey. Sorry, mute. I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, effectively, we end up, the, the first step is um, what Gateway has is a, is a license and they can delegate the authority to you um, for that license uh, to operate as an insurance intermediary. But that comes with guardrails as well. Um, so a lot of work's been put into getting the compliance regimes, getting uh, satisfying all of those regulatory, um, I, I guess, uh, operational pieces that you need to have in place, and also to be able to get into the market much more quickly um, as an appointed representative. And then at some time when it comes to getting your full um, FCA authorizations, um, you already have so much in place. So in our example, we operated under a point of representative status with the gateways permissions um, for about eight or nine months. And then when we submitted our final application, it took six weeks for us to go from zero to approved on our own. And that's quite something in this market. You hear stories of 18 months, a year, two years, sort of. Um, so that, that, that to me is very much, uh, it's not just about the ability to become an appointed representative. It's about all of the I guess all of the conditions that come with that, um, and that teaches you to to operate an insurance business without having to go through the full approval process and prove that you can operate an insurance business. That doesn't exist, if you see what I'm saying. Part yeah, it's a real it's a real chicken and egg difficulty. You need in order to get approval, you need to have a working business model, but you can't get a you can't have a working business model without the insurance. So that for me is one of the, the great things that Gateway have done is to enable the right businesses to get or be able to prove that their business works and then use that as the springboard in order to smash through the FCA um, regulatory approval process in, as Mark said, you know, a, a really, really short amount of time. And you can, you can do that. You can make that happen because you can demonstrate your business is compliant and you know, that saves you a lot of pain. Excellent. Um, I, um, I have a question here. I don't even, I don't even know obviously in terms of obviously what the question is exactly. So that's why obviously the, you guys are here because it's great that you can ask this. Um, Rob says, and forgive me, I've just lost the question. What is an annuity business and why do I need one? Forgive me if I pronounce that incorrectly, annuity. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's correct. I mean, essentially, in fact, we we heard it with Kimberly saying about food tech. You know, once you've sold a meal or you've you've done something, you've you, you've lost that client until they might may or may not come around next time to buy another meal. Um, the insurance industry offers all these uh, fantastic renewal processes that actually, if you if you treat a customer fairly and you do the job that you are promised to do, and the trust is there, as we've heard about. Uh, you will start the beginning of January, if that's the beginning of your financial year, with. 10,000 clients who most of those, unless they die or they you, you've managed to upset them along the way, will want to renew next year. They found a need the first year and they would want to carry on insuring themselves for the second year and third year and fourth year. So coming into the insur insurance space and insure tech space, you, you found yourself with a scenario where you build a business, you acquire a customer and you keep them for a long time and you retain that value all the way through until he, he ceases to be a client. So. The annuity income is very predictable. It enables you to fund yourself to a clear route to financial stability, hence the different stages of pre-seed, seed, uh, series A, series B. So it's a, it's a really good way of making sure that you, um, uh, you're not just having to buy a new customer every time you sell a meal. Does that make sense? Yep, perfect. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for that definition as well. Um, the, John has asked, how are insure techs finding their own insurance protection? Uh, availability of cover stroke premium levels, question mark. Um, anybody want to jump in on that one? I can jump in again in terms of the, the uh, again, going at a steady pace to make sure that we meet certain targets is that the early stage insurance 
business, we're, we're also we're lucky, lucky to be backed by a number of different insurers. We've probably got about 20 uh, people that we could talk to in terms of making sure capacity is there. Um, and it's not, a, it's not an issue in the early stage. A definition of the product is a difficulty at the early stage. If people understand what the risk is, uh, you, can, you can make it insurable. And that's really what the gateway does, is we want to make things insurable and investable. Once you do that, we, we then make sure that the product fits the need. And once you have a product that fits a need, it's insuring, uh, it, it's, it's being insured properly and the insurers are making money and all stakeholders are being benefited, you know, benefiting from it, then it, it's relatively straightforward. And that's, I think we've heard the word intimidating as, from the insurance piece earlier, is that the insurance world is intimidating until you understand how the risk metrics work. Okay, John comes back and says, does that include both the product side and the regulatory side? Yes, yes. So we go through different stages to, uh, as Mark was saying, is that uh, he worked for eight months on there are approvals from a regulatory point of view and then moved to his own in a very quick space of time because of all the frameworks we put in place. And same, same again is that nobody really wants to be piggybacking off anybody else's either authorities or underwriting capacity. You want your own you have to choose you have to prove your product in market first before you uh, have your own otherwise you'll spend two or three years trying to get everything in place before you prove that your product fits the market need okay great stuff robert thank you um thank you for all the fantastic questions as well it's great to have a floor where there's great questions coming in um sometimes that's why virtual actually works better than in real life because sometimes people don't like that microphone being passed to them um Obviously, I'm just going to ask one quick question to Liam before we pass back to Hannah, who's going to final final words on everything. Um, Liam, obviously, in terms of uh, Tech Nation, can you explain a little bit about obviously your role within that and the fintech element um, of how you work on specific programs, perhaps? Yeah, so um, the sort of like the really quick version um, before we wrap up. Uh, Tech Nation is a government-backed um, organisation that supports. Um, um, scaling companies in various different ways. So the programs is one part of our um, proposition. So that's supporting companies all the way from the early stage pre-seed for our Rising Stars program, um, going up to um, Series B in our Future 50 programs, um, creating communities, connecting um, them with uh, investors, uh, corporates, etc. cetera. Um, and then we've got a few other pillars, one being insights, which is all about um, developing reports on the UK tech ecosystem. Um, another one is our visa program, which is um, the only um, body in the UK that endorses the global tech visa um, within the UK. So um, a lot of people come into the UK um, based on that. Um, and then we've got our digital business academy, which is some education for growing um, businesses at a very, very early stage. So it's, it's a multifaceted, um, but all supporting scale up companies through their journeys. Okay, great stuff. Thank you for that. Um, obviously, I can only speak on behalf of obviously the, the work that we do with Tech Nation to say that the enablement of uh, the regional entrepreneur managers has really helped obviously drive Tech Nation across the whole of the UK. And that's a fantastic thing um, because we're seeing a lot more strength coming through from from the UK region, certainly in terms of obviously the work that's being championed and the businesses that are being championed as well. So thank you, Liam, as well. Um, I know Hannah is a stickler for time um, and I think I've pretty much kept on it. So I'm gonna pass you back to Hannah for the final words. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Al. Impeccable timekeeping today. Bang on one o'clock for a finish. So I just wanted to um, thank the speakers once more for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Again, echoing Al, thank you for tuning in, audience out there, and for all your great questions. If you are watching and you have an early stage tech business or idea, and you're interested in exploring InsureTech, either as a new business model or to enable the growth of another sector, please get in touch with Oliver. He's very friendly, and you can reach him at oliver at insuretechgateway.com thanks again to everyone um, and al from startica for being such a great co-host